The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, a senior China Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, last year in our year-end show, we said looking forward to 2019, one of the topics that we're going to focus a lot of attention on this year is the China-Africa technology relationship. And it is becoming so interesting, much more so than I even expected back in December. In just the past few weeks, we've seen a number of headlines on the tech front, new phone brands coming in uh, from the Chinese side. Uh, Alibaba is deepening their relationship in Rwanda. And then, of course, it is also a worrisome relationship where we're seeing more concerns about the role of Huawei and ZTE in terms of putting on technology into network operation centers that are being used for surveillance and repression. And it brings up this issue about technology is just the same as every other topic in the China-Africa discourse, where you can see in it what you want. If we want to spend the next 30 minutes of our show talking about all the terrible things that happen because of China, Chinese technology in Africa, there is ample material to do that. Similarly, if we want to spend the next 30 minutes talking about the amazing things that Chinese technology is doing in Africa today, we can also do that as well. So, Kobus, in some ways, this is the ideal topic for us because we're going to take on both of these conversations. And let's before we get into the details, though, I just wanted to highlight a few of the good and a few of the bad. Let's start with the good right now. China has almost single-handedly built the African ICT market, the information communications technology market, backed with loans supported by China's policy banks, Companies like Huawei and ZTE have wired up almost the entire continent. It is remarkable the speed with which they have done that. They've built massive network operation centers in places like Djibouti. They're bringing in massive, big trunks of, of bandwidth uh, in the new undersea cables. And building the entire telecommunications ecosystem from the back-end network all the way to the modems to the front-end smartphones that people use. When we think about the smartphone market in Africa today... One company controls a third of it, Transin from Shenzhen in southern China. More Chinese companies are coming in every day. Chinese e-commerce is now making its way to the continent, most notably Alibaba in Rwanda, but we're also seeing the arrival of WeChat and Tencent products throughout the continent as well. Union pay for financial services is coming. And there are so many great stories about how Chinese money, technology, and know-how are playing an increasingly important role in the African tech sector. However, as we said at the top, those same companies are also reported to be selling some of the world's most advanced surveillance technologies that are being used in a number of countries to monitor, censor, and repress dissidents. Just think about this, that it was in the DR Congo during the elections, Kobus, about uh, three or four weeks ago, there was uh, a lot of disturbances and they shut down the internet in big parts of it. And people said, uh-oh, this is the export or the import, if you will, into Africa of Chinese methods of information technology control. So it's not just the technology that's being brought in from China, but also the methods as well. So we're gonna talk about all that today, but Kobus, when you look at the China-Africa tech relationship, what side do you fall on? More on the optimism side or more on the pessimism side? I tend to fall a little bit more on the optimism side, um, simply because living in Africa, you can really see on a daily basis, how people are, are taking up tech, how the, the kind of the, the role that social media is playing in, in allowing people to express themselves, how the rapid kind of way that that African creative people of, of different different industries, including designers, music people, and so on, use social media to, to build their brands incredibly rapidly, and how it's increasingly creating interconnections between different African hubs, you know, kind of where it becomes a lot easier for pop culture to travel between uh, between Lagos and Johannesburg, for example. Um, on the other hand, um, 
you know, for me, the problem with, with the reporting around these issues is the problem that I, that I always raise, which is that, you know, the reporting coming from the West tends to look at, at these at, at the problematic side of, of these relationships as the export of Chinese problematic models to Africa rather than the use by African governments of Chinese tools. Um, and, you know, and, and with that, yeah, you know... That's a difference, of, a very important distinction to make. Yeah, you know, and, and, and with that frequently a, a very low awareness and, and I think a, quite a low interest in what goes on within African governments, you know, um, you know among in reporters in the West. Um, so I think there lies the problem. It's like, you know, the African governments are work within opacity and now they're getting more tools to work to work Look, uh, to extend their powers in a more opaque way. Um, and I think I think there's really the problem. So one article that came out just in the past week it was by Bloomberg, uh, an investigative reporter there named Sheridan Prasso, who's based out of the Hong Kong Bureau of Bloomberg, wrote an article called China's Digital Silk Road is Looking More Like an Iron Curtain. And it's, again, you see in this relationship what you want. I'd like to invite Sheridan to come on the show because I disagreed with the way that she did a lot of her reporting. But at the same time, it does highlight a lot of what Kobus said in terms of the agency of the different parties involved. Is something being put upon them or is someone accepting it? So let's dive into this now. We wanted to get two experts who could give us perspectives from both the Chinese side and the African side. And so we're thrilled to have on the show for the first time, Seram Avle, who's an assistant professor of communications at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. A very good morning to you, Sarah. Oh, good evening to you, Eric. A good evening. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> also Sylvia Littner, who's an assistant professor of information at the University of Michigan. A very chilly good morning to you in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Eric. Good to be here. Well, we're happy that both of you could be here because the two of you have been working together on a number of papers and research in China, in the U.S., in Ghana, and to some extent even in Jamaica, comparing it. Seram, why don't you just introduce a little bit about your research and what you what you have been doing together with Sylvia, and before we kind of get into some of the more topical issues, so we can kind of set the table of where you're coming from on these issues and what your outlook is on China Africa Tech in 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 2019. Sure, thank you. Um, so my research has been on technology production in Ghana primarily um, for the last seven or so years. So I've been asking questions um, such as who is designing digital technologies? How are they doing it within what is considered a resource constrained environment? Um, and what can we learn? Why is that important to, to investigate? Um, about two or three years ago, Sylvia and I met um, and really uh, talked about similarities in our work where she's been working in China for the last decade um, um, and asking similar questions, but looking into the maker uh, community, uh, we came together, wrote a grant for the National Science Foundation about looking into these transnational networks that we were observing between Ghana, China and Silicon Valley. And so for the last two years, we've been traveling and working together on making sense of these connections between these really important nodes of technological production um, and investigating how that uh, materializes in various um, uh, realities for all the people involved. So to, to which extent, I mean, this is such a basic, somewhat dumb question, but to, to which extent do you feel, does a China-Africa tech sector really exist? I mean, in, in your work that you that you mentioned now, you're looking essentially at a triangular kind of, uh, you, you know, structure between Silicon Valley, China and Africa. Um, to which extent is that a unified structure? To which extent is U.S. and Chinese technology, do they sit side by side in Africa? Is there a, a movement from one to the other? Like, how should we think about it in very broad terms? Um, Sylvia, why, why don't you take that? Sure. Um, so I think there's multiple different entry points to that question, right? Sort of there is an official discourse, right? When you sort of look at the macro level of how um, both China and various countries in Africa are positioning their relationships and how the tech corporations involved position their relationship um, to the other regions. So that is one particular way to go about it. And Serum and I have spent some time looking at this official discourse. And there you find a lot of focus on you know, sort of um, a story around future making, about um, a sort of hopeful narrative and a promising narrative, right, to um, sort of make a case for how digital technology and tech entrepreneurship in particular um, can enable new forms of economic development 
And China's often posed in these stories as a model, um, both from the Chinese discourse side and from the African discourse side, where you sort of have um, a story going on, you know, that's sort of positioning China's like, look what China did over the last um, 30 to 40 years uh, throughout economic development and post-socialist China. Look what it has accomplished. And this is also possible for Africa. And at the same time, there's, of course, then you know, when you look underneath that discourse, a lot of tensions around that very question of like, who gets to decide what technology development and innovation looks like and how its relationship to economic development plays out. And so we have also looked at this particular question to look sort of beyond sort of the official discourse, to look at what actually the people are making of all of this, right? And so we have followed a variety of entrepreneurs, you know, people who travel, for example, from Ghana to Shenzhen or people who have been working in the Shenzhen manufacturing ecosystem for more than 20 years, who are now beginning to set up factories in Africa. So in those narratives, you have, you have people who are obviously very familiar with the official discourse, you know, but people also differentiate their own work from that. Um, and so basically what you get is a multitude of, of relationships, you know, that basically make, um, I would say, a China-Africa um, tech relationship happen on the ground, so to say. So just to follow what you're saying there, the traditional China-Africa tech relationship is entrepreneur in Africa. And I remember there was the, remember the Congo phone from back in 2012 or 13, I think it was the CMK phone or something like mm -hmm. that. And, and the model was he designed, he customized basically an Android skin, went to Shenzhen to build a phone at low cost and re-import them back into the Congo. That was the, you know, taking advantage of everybody's specialty, a localized skin, a localized software with China's lean manufacturing advantages. That seems to be still the way that things are being done. Talk to us a little bit about the terms, because when you say tech, are you talking about merging African business models with Chinese hardware? Or are we talking about AI? Are we, what, are, what exactly are we talking about when you say the word tech and how has the ecosystem evolved from those early days where it was Chinese hardware and African entrepreneurs? Sure. I think when we talk about tech, we talk about it in in two ways. So on the one hand, um, we talk about hardware and how people have been experimenting with new models of hardware. So Sarah mentioned that I've been doing this research in, in China for some time. Over the last five years specifically, I looked a lot at mobile phone production and how that has changed um, in Shenzhen and specifically the sort of open source model that's applied to manufacturing there. So, you know, historically, we all know that a lot of our you know, electronic products are made in China. China has also been very ambitious to move beyond this label of made in China and be seen globally as a hub for design and creation and innovation. And so you've seen a lot of these, you know, sort of, I would say, macro scale level um, visions for innovation change in China unfold in practice in places like Shenzhen, where basically people have been very active in hardware production, manufacturing, are now also very eager to decide design and to do innovation. And I think this is where basically people meet um, right at this intersection. So you see people in, in Africa who are similarly interested in asserting that design can come out of Africa and that creativity and innovation can come out of Africa. And so in both regions, we've met people who are very excited about challenging the sort of Western-centric notion of that design can only happen in a place like Silicon Valley. And I would say the digital and what technology means for them is exactly at this intersection of like, what could an African innovation culture mean? What would, what could a Chinese innovation culture look like? And so a lot of the people we met think of themselves as partners in this process, think of themselves as um, partners in defining new ways of what design can look like in the first place and how technology can look like in the first place. Sarah, um, um, following up on that, um, in your work in Ghana, um, what, what were the kind of fields that you saw the most exciting innovation happening in? And what were the, you know, in which ways were African needs being turned into, into tech products? I mean, you know, for, it, to my mind, one of, one of the great innovators, the great tech 
uh, innovations coming out of Africa over the last few years has been in Pesa in um, in the micro micro payment um, system in in Kenya, where they managed to turn you know kind of a, a massive African problem you know the the low level of banking um, and and the difficulty of making small payments into uh, into a, a, a massive kind of field for innovation. Um, do you see similar kind of of kind of creative you know problem transformations happening in Ghana as well? Oh, certainly. Um, there is a whole lot more happening uh, on the continent than M-Pesa. Um, but I'll start with financial tech, um, which uh, you mentioned. So in Ghana, for instance, um, part of the challenge of sending, for instance, mobile money was that, uh, you know, maybe two or three years ago, they were not interoperable, right? Um, and so one uh, crea- uh, crea- creation there has been to figure out how to connect all these different telcos. You know, if you are on MTN or you're on Vodafone, how do you send money, mobile money to um, other people? Um, and there have been a number of companies such as Extra Spade that have been kind of trying to address this problem and have become quite popular in use in Ghana. Um, so there's the financial sector. Um, for me, what some of the most exciting uh, action I would say is happening in uh, in agriculture, actually, um, and you know, one one really consistent problem in Ghana has been to get um, you know food uh, from different parts of Ghana um, to you know, uh, 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 for instance, from uh, from plains to Accra, um, and you know, post harvest loss is one. Uh, really serious challenge that people have been talking about. But even beyond that, the idea that Ghana kind of imports uh, a number of different uh, food items when it could grow them has been a topic of conversation uh, in the last few years. And so um, what I've seen in response to that is multiple companies. So for instance, um, Farmable um, that, uh, that you know, targets uh, smallholder farmers, Trotro Tractor, um, which tries to match, again, smallholder farmers with people who have tractors um, to help them, uh, uh, you know, build uh, their farms. So so using a location device um, and, you know, really simple uh, ideas that are perhaps overlooked in other parts of the world uh, and changing the way that smallholder farming, which is really the more popular way of farming in Ghana, um, can benefit from technology. There are other companies um, uh, such as Complete Farmer that is doing really incredible things that is helping, uh, you know, ranching or expanding agriculture. Um, and so taking, for instance, investments from Ghanaians and Africans in the diaspora uh, and doing the farming for them. So I was recently in Ghana and went to uh, to see one of the land that they are developing uh, for, um, you know, I, you know, things that can be exported, but also uh, food crops that are easier to deliver within the country. So there are all kinds of interesting things where technology might not uh, be the main focus, but really the technology is trying to bridge, um, you know, infrastructure or fill infrastructural gaps um, in ways that may not seem obvious at first go. And so for me, when we talk about technology in Ghana, it's really the interesting uh, little pieces that, for instance, something simple as GPS might uh, solve a rather large problem in a sector such as a Greek. Um, so there are a lot of things. There's like SNU code that um, has also tried to solve the problem of digital addressing, right? So a lot of, if you say, if you, if you ever lived in Ghana, you couldn't get a street address for mailing uh, uh, your products or mailing simple anything. Um, and so what Snuco did was create a very accurate way using very simple, te- well, it's simple on the front end, but quite complicated in the back end, um, where you create a digital address system of simple letters and numbers that anybody can remember. You don't have to have a fancy degree to use this, and you don't really, even really need a smartphone to do it. So um, creating a solution that makes it easy for people to find each other and has been working with the police service and the fire service um, to help them really locate victims uh, much more quicker than before where you you know you give addresses by saying go past the person selling this and the blue kiosk and whatnot so <laughs> there are so many things happening in Ghana um, as as there are in other parts of, of, of the world um, or in other parts of Africa so yeah I mean I could go on and on giving you examples of these um, products that have been deployed in Ghana and are working uh, a lot of them are profitable and a lot of them really are solving um, very specific problems that they find in Ghana, but also realize that are similar in other African countries and therefore um, are looking more regional and more global in their outlook, right? So they begin and test in Ghana and they are really uh, looking to expand to the continent. Support for this podcast comes from the Africa Channel Reporting Project at Wits University School of Journalism in Johannesburg. The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops, and other professional development opportunities for both African and Chinese journalists. 
Follow the ACRP on Twitter at Vets China Africa or visit africachinareporting.co.za for information about grants and upcoming seminars. I want to shift gears now a little bit to, again, the political side and the policy side and related to tech and, and, and a little bit to the controversies that have been floating around. There was a tragic uh, terrorist attack in Nairobi uh, where 14 people were killed, even some in the U.S. tech sector. There was one gentleman who I saw on LinkedIn today uh, who, who, who passed away from, from that incident. And I was talking to several of my Chinese colleagues today, and their response was very, very interesting. They said, you know, they're not using advanced surveillance techniques like we have here in China to monitor al-Shabaab and to be able to see the threats before they come. That was their assessment of it. And I thought that was an interesting take because here in China, we are blanketed in surveillance. We are blanketed in facial recognition everywhere we go. Now, there's an upside to that. I can sit on the subway next to the door at rush hour with an $1,000 Galaxy Samsung, uh, Samsung Galaxy phone and not have any concern whatsoever that anybody's going to rip that phone out of my hand and run out of the subway. In a city of 25 million people, that is remarkable because six facial recognition cameras will hit that guy before he gets out of the subway station. They know that. Now, that's a plus side of it. The downside is it is if you disagree with what the Chinese government has to say, well, they can find you very, very quickly. And the Chinese now, through companies, uh, Hick Vision is one of them, uh, Cloudwalk is another one, are exporting this technology to Africa and to many parts of the world. Zambia has a deal with, uh, with Hick Vision. Cloudwalk had a contract in Z- uh, Zimbabwe, but I understand that has now been put up for uh, renegotiation. Uh, Hick Vision has set up a, a, an R&D lab in South Africa as well. And the reason why they're going there in part is because they want to start collecting data. And in order to make artificial intelligence systems work well, it needs to be fed with enormous amounts of data. That's number one. Number two is governments like Edgar Lungu in Zambia and the Ethiopian government and Zimbabwe, uh, they want this technology in order to, uh, for security purposes. Now, some are saying that they're using it to suppress their dissidents and their uh, political opponents. Certainly that's believable in Rwanda with Paul Kagame. Uh, Kobus, I even think the South African government is now using facial recognition or soon to use Chinese facial recognition in, uh, in, 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 in Johannesburg at the airports and whatnot. So it's Apparently, coming yes. in. And again, so Sylvia, you have spent a lot of time in China. You're familiar with the culture of surveillance that's here. It is, it's here. It's not a secret. It's not even that sensitive an issue to talk about here because it's like, well, it rains and there's surveillance. I mean, that's just the way <laughs> that life is. Uh, it's new in Africa and it's very, very controversial. Talk to us a little bit about the concerns of Chinese surveillance technology, the darker side of technology. It's a tool, can be used for good and for bad, and how African governments, particularly autocratic governments, may use some of this technology. Yeah, so I think that's a really interesting and complex question. I think we should go back a little bit in time, you know, because what what you were just describing about sitting on the subway and not worrying about your mobile phone being stolen. That was exactly the same experience I had living in China 10 years ago. Um, so I would say there's both sort of a narrative built up right now that sort of, um, I think that, and you mentioned that in the beginning of, of our podcast, right? There's a sort of narrative built up that, especially in Western media, portrays sort of China's surveillance technology as all encompassing, all consuming, complete, right? And the reality, I think, of this looks very different, at least when I was in China very recently, just a couple of months ago. You know, my sense was much more that what China is currently doing is actually experimenting with a variety of different techniques. And you just mentioned some of these technologies. So what we're seeing is rather than a seamless operation, we're seeing a government that very strategically uses its relationship to tech corporations and digital advances, no matter if that is um, artificial intelligence or data mining, um, for experimenting with new relationships to its own citizens and also for repositioning China globally. And that, I think, is the really interesting question of, like, where do these experiments, what, what do they end up, you know, where, where do they go? What different shades do they take on in different regions, even in China? So when you think about um, the experiments and extreme forms of surveillance that are currently happening in Xinjiang, and if you compare that, for example, to a city like Shanghai or Beijing or Shenzhen, right, you see a very, very different system in place. 
And how I've been thinking about this is really to think about, you know, China has long been using various techniques of experimentation as a form of governance. This goes all the way back and has very well been documented in, in, in China studies, um, you know, for many, many years, sort of using various forms and techniques of experimentation to govern their own people. And this goes back to socialism, Mao, and has also been a very central technique during the 1980s and 90s when China was experimenting with new forms of economic development and adapting to a capitalist market model. And yet at the same time, keeping in place um, references to socialism and certain practices that were tied and left over from that time. So I think about sort of the adoption and the experimentation with artificial intelligence and facial recognition to unfold along very similar lines. And so in my experience, China has also adopted a very similar approach to how it positions itself globally. And I think we see this play out in Africa, where China adopts a very different approach depending on the local governments, where it basically fluidly fairly fluidly um, arranges different forms of implementation, different forms of partnerships with local governments, depending on the particular form of governance there. And so I think what is really interesting to look at, um, especially from a research um, and journalism, journalistic um, point of view, is to look at these very specific instantiations of how these various forms of experimentation with new technology currently then intercept with new modes of governance and how both China is experimenting with its own you know, role in sort of global geopolitics, um, China repositioning, the party repositioning itself vis-a-vis -vis its own people. Um, and you see a very strong narrative there under Xi Jinping, you know, really crafting a very different kind of relationship that, of course, builds on earlier models, right? It's not all new, um, but really sort of experimenting with a new relationship that on the one hand is asserting much more control, but also brings citizens and other regions into sort of what the government sees as the future of both technology and its own global position. Um, and so I think that is a, that is the really interesting, a really interesting aspect of all of this, that we don't just have one particular form or one particular policy in place, but a multitude of, you know, sort of laboratories and experiments with where China could end up in the next 10 years. Seram, I was wondering how you see this playing out in Africa. I mean, it seems to me that in, in a lot of the logic when, when people talk about the, the kind of exporting of this kind of system from China to Africa is that there's a logic in China where the very high levels of, of um, technological surveillance is coupled with a very capable state, you know, kind of a, a state where there's a lot of, you know, a lot of police cars, for example, a lot of, you know, like the, everyone has all of the, all of the kind of uh, resources that they need to, to, uh, to enact full blanket security. Um, in Africa, that's frequently not the case. And, and I think, you know, the, frequently in Africa, the, A, there's a, there's a general kind of lack of resources, but then also, you know, the amount of resources that there are is, is frequently moved around in a kind of a political way, you know, kind of where you would have, where, which which leads to a kind of a plausible deniability in, in terms of a form of, of repression. So, you know, if you happen to be a, a, an opposition politician and your house happens to be to burn down, there might be a chance that there is just simply not a, a you know, kind of a, a kind of firefighting staff available. This is, happens to not be available, you know, which which can be both true because you are an opposition politician and or because they might they might actually not be available, um, you know. So so it, it seems like the the kind of resources of the government and the the, the way that the government uses resources in many African countries plays in a different way than they would in China. And then I wonder how that will then you know, kind of be connected to the kind of provision of this kind of very high levels of surveillance. What 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 are your thoughts? Um it's a you know, you're you're quite right that um there are a number of challenges to implementing a similar kind of structure. Um, surveillance works really well, like you said, when there is a capable state that can enforce. Um, and so for me, when we talk about Chinese technology and maybe exporting Chinese surveillance, um, it becomes even trickier to talk because of you know the 54 countries on the continent, um, for the most part, have different levels of different kinds of governments, even though we might classify them into autocratic versus democratic. Um, they have different structures, governance really works at very different levels within each country. And so it's tough 
have to kind of speak of a blanket surveillance. And you're right, if you cannot enforce certain things, um, you know, you might not have a similar outcome as you might in China. For instance, if we go back to that story about um, someone's phone being stolen on the subway. Um, that said, you know, African governments, I would say, have been collecting citizen data in various forms for many years, right? So, for instance, um, I can speak for Ghana, you know, the biometric uh, data, right? Um, you know, even simple things for every country, um, such as um, your driver's license. So there is a lot of uh, relationship, different kinds of relationships between governments and their citizens, where they, for me, they hold a lot of citizen data um, and the surveillance technologies that we're seeing are simply building and adding onto that. What, you know, the challenge there is how can they be deployed, whether in the name of security or whether in the name of persecution. Um, I think it's still early days to really figure out how to, you know, characterize this. Um, I will say, though, that for countries that kind of look like China, for instance, Ethiopia, I can imagine that it's much easier to deploy uh, surveillance technology in the same kind of effects um, as it's taking place in, in China. Whereas, for instance, in Ghana, you might have civil society on the government's case um, that might create a protracted argument about whether or not these technologies will work or whether we should even purchase these technologies. So again, the system of governance really does mediate or maybe even moderate um, the impact of the surveillance technologies and how well they can be, well, you know, you know how effective they can be used to government's end. Um, and so it's really still an open question for me, but I, I, at this point. Sarah Mavle is an assistant professor of communications at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, one of the most beautiful parts of the world you'll ever go to. Uh, similarly, Sylvia Littner is an assistant professor of information at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, equally beautiful as well, cold and chilly at this time of year. Uh, we thank you both for taking the time this morning to join us and to talk about this absolutely fascinating topic. And we hope that you'll be able to come back to us because we didn't really get even into artificial intelligence. And, oh, there's just so much. So we would love to to have you back on the show. Seeing that you guys are both in the tech space I'm hoping that you are the rare academic that has social media channels. Uh, do you guys have, uh, <laughs> are you on social media if people want to follow what you're reading and writing these days, Sayram and Sylvia? Uh, yes. Uh, so I'm at Sayram Avle on Twitter. So just uh, the two names together. Um, I am not on Facebook. Um, I haven't been for 10 years for multiple reasons. We can talk about that if you want. Um, but <laughs> it's probably I'm, a smart move. <laughs> probably a smart move now. Yeah, but I, I, I support I, yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and I'm on LinkedIn, I think, um, as well. Um, Sylvia, you are on Twitter. Yeah, I'm, I'm on Twitter, Facebook, WeChat. Um, I, you can find all of the information on my personal website, sylvielindner.com, and I look forward to connecting. <laughs> Great. Well, I'll put links to both of both of their social media. This is a pleasant surprise. And again, I would have been severely disappointed if you didn't have at least one social media. And I understand, you know, as tech people, maybe you actually know better than the rest of us not to be on social media for the very <laughs> surveillance problems that we've been talking about. But nonetheless, thank you so much for for taking the time to join us. We really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you so much for having us. Kobus, the complicating thing for me after hearing what the two professors had to say was, again, they're not on one side or the other. And what they said was, again, we hear this time and time again when we talk to China-Africa specialists. It really depends on the level of governance in each country. So China behaves differently in South Africa than it does in Congo, than it does in Ghana. And each country is different. We heard that in our discussion with Fola Shade Sule uh, as well on negotiations so I think that's an interesting theme that we can start stretching across some of the different China-Africa narratives that we discuss on the program. And it really was interesting for me, again, I want to bring up this article by Sheridan Prasso, and I really recommend everybody go and read it. It's China's digital silk road is looking more like an iron curtain. She spent time focusing on the role of Chinese technology in Zambia, and it was a decidedly negative article. And again, I have no problem with anything that she wrote in the article. Everything there probably was true. Here was where my problem was and then broader China-Africa tech discussion as a whole. She didn't put it in a context that the Chinese are not the only ones selling oppressive, repressive technologies. We know from the Snowden files that the United States government was working with the Ethiopian government on these types of technologies. We know for a fact that Israel is exporting these technologies. The Italians are, the French are as well. These are facts, and she didn't put it in the, the broader context. 
that China is one player in a global market for these types of technologies. I thought that was missing. The other thing that was missing from her article, in my opinion, was she had no Chinese voice in the article. She said she went to Huawei and got no comment. She said she went to the Chinese embassy and got no comment. Any reporter who covers China knows you're not going to get a comment from the embassy or Huawei. By definition, you're not going to get that. But that doesn't mean you give up. You have to have the Chinese voice in these stories. And instead, what she did was she had Zambian officials basically representing the Chinese voice and defending their decision to purchase Chinese technology. But she didn't come to the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, the Shanghai Institute of International Studies. She didn't come to any of the leading Chinese think tanks or to get people uh, who are Chinese stakeholders in China or outside to comment. And to me, for an investigative story from Bloomberg, that is wrong. The last thing that she did, which I took measure, I took offense, not offense, but I just took issue with, was she went out on Twitter and thanked her sources. And her sources were human rights groups and people in RWR consultancy in Washington, which is an American consultancy that monitors Belt and Road. And again, it just showed a lack of balance for me. I thought that was inappropriate journalistically for her to have a story about Zambian Chinese stakeholders and then to thank basically white people and human rights groups. And I don't look at human rights groups as nonpartisan actors. They are actors like everybody else with agendas. Their agendas may be noble, but certainly in some parts of the world, like in China, Vietnam, parts of Africa, governments there don't look at them as being impartial. And so for a journalist to embrace human rights groups, I thought was also inappropriate. So I took issue with it. She got into a squabble with me on Twitter. I don't like to fight on Twitter because it's a stupid way to fight. But it, to me, it brought up what you were talking about in, in your point was how the narrative can is oftentimes very, very polarized. And this article that she wrote highlighted a lot of the key themes, good reporting where she did it. I thought it was great reporting, but I thought it was missing some other key pieces. Yeah, for me, it, it what, what I, I read her, her her article as well, um, and I, I think you know I, I need to read it again actually with you know kind of with with more you know having now thought about everything that you mentioned. Um, the one thing that that I found a bit problematic about it is that, and, and this is not her problem specifically. This is something I, that's almost I, I find it almost a default in 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 Western reporting about about China Africa relations. Is there is that there's so. Um, there's so little attention paid to the complexities of Western involvement in Africa um, that, and and because it's a China Africa story, they I mean reporters frequently, especially when they have word limits, they feel that that is kind of extraneous context that can be left out. But then, what it, the, the effect then is that it it provides it makes it very easy to assume that western you know that western involvement in africa is only in the you know it's only in terms of the kind of concerned hand wringing about the possible deterioration of human rights situations in africa which is true for certain western actors but even in the case where it is true for western actors that comes with a a network of power relations that are not unpacked in these articles. So, um, you know, so what I find then is that China can then very conveniently stand in for the kind of anti-West. Like everything China is doing, it assumes that the West is not doing. And as you, as you have said, you know, kind of we we know that Western tech companies are highly involved in 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 and providing services to many authoritarian African governments. And we also know, um, and this is what what. It Eugenio Galeardoni has shown in his research, who we and we interviewed him uh, last year, um, and his book will actually come out in, in somewhere in 2019. Um, so we'll probably have him back then. Is that one of the, the main reason that like that that African governments give the main the main language that they use for repressive measures in their own country is not a Chinese-style harmonious society narrative. What they use is the language of the U.S. war on terror. And frequently they use literal, you know, kind of they use the U.S. war on terror and its general kind of, you know, we need to crack down on X, Y, Z, Islamic groups, for example. The, 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 it's literally a kind of a copy and paste from, from, that, from that discourse frequently. So, you know, it's not so simple to be like, oh, you know, the West is concerned and China is exporting all of this damaging technology. Um, 
um, I think what what you need a lot more of is unpacking what African governments actually want, um, and that and frequently that remains this kind of blank space. Two people that I'm recommending that if you're interested in China Africa tech that you follow Harriet Kiruki is a uh, is a tech specialist out of Nairobi. Uh, she studied in Beijing. We had her on the show a couple months ago. I recommend that you go back and listen to that podcast. But she on LinkedIn writes some really great things about China Africa tech and also the emerging tech scene in Nairobi. Uh, and also Stephanie Zhou, who is the uh, founder of the China Africa Tech Initiative. She also works in Africa's blockchain uh, market. Uh, she too is based out of Nairobi. She too posts a lot of interesting things on LinkedIn. So those are two recommendations that uh, I, I really think you should follow on LinkedIn. We do post quite a bit on that as well, particularly following the cell phone and some of the e-commerce issues that are coming from China into Africa. So we'd love to have you join our discussions and to participate and let us know what you think. Also, we want to give a shout out to Elise Thomas from Australia. And she wrote us to request a show on uh, Russia's growing influence in Africa, and particularly because John Bolton, the U.S. National Security Advisor, he specifically focused on Russia and China as a challenge to the United States. So we're looking now for a Russia-Africa specialist. If you have any recommendations, please do send me an email. My email address is in the show notes. Uh, we are on the hunt now because uh, Elise made that great suggestion for us. So if you have a suggestion on a topic that you're interested in, we love getting notes from you. Uh, we, I think, have fixed your email, Cobus, right? Yes, yes. Great. So, Cobus' email, Cobus at ChinaAfricaProject.com. I'm Eric at ChinaAfricaProject.com. Please feel free to write us. I usually get back to people within 24 hours. I love to hear from the audience. Cobus, now that he's got email up and running, uh, would also love to hear from you. So, you know, are, do you agree? Do you disagree? Uh, do you want us to have future guests on or find out about our travel, speaking engagements? We're, we love to hear from you. So, so that'll do it for this edition of the China in Africa podcast. Kobus and I will be back again next week with another show. For Kobus van Staden in Johannesburg, I'm Eric Olander in Shanghai. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China and Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com.